I'm delighted to be here today and thank you so much for coming. It's a great audience and I hope I'll introduce you to a subject that I've been interested in for, for most of my adult life um, and have tried to distill into this little book. Um, it's, I've got a co-author who was actually a student of mine, uh, Katie Van, Van Dorn, who works in the US and so we tried to make sure that the book wasn't just a UK based book. She's brought in some ideas, particularly and she's also Dutch, so we've got the European and the US perspective. Um, I'll, I'll, so she's, she's, uh, she works in the, in, the, in the US at the moment. So I, I'm going to try and just briefly introduce you to this area. Um, it it's it's covers a range of, 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 of specialities, but I'm going to tend to speak from my own experience, which is inevitable. Uh, I'm, I'm, um, I've, I've worked as a clinical psychologist, originally training just to work in, in, in clinical work, but in later years I found myself being more interested in research and then eventually in teaching and training. So my last post for the last uh, 20 years has been running the, the doctoral training course in Oxford to train new clinical psychologists. And as such, I had to have a kind of overview of the whole subject and hopefully was then therefore in a good position to write this very short introduction. As you know, it's 35,000 words, and I worked in the area for about 40 years, so about 1,000 words per year of my life went into this book, and therefore it's quite crammed. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is really talk to you about what it's about and what we're trying to do as clinical psychologists. And I suppose the best place to start is, if you like, what I often say to my own family and to myself, which is it's actually tough being human. Being a human being is difficult. We have so many differences and difficulties to deal with in our lives, complex feelings, emotions, desires, challenges throughout life, managing other people, managing ourselves, managing the world around us. So I've always been interested, how do people do this? How do people tick? And what happens when it goes wrong? And there have always been p difficulties in life. We are not unique in finding life sometimes problematic. If you've never experienced emotional difficulties or relationship difficulties in your life, then you're incredibly lucky, and I think you're probably quite rare. Sooner or later in your life, there are things which go wrong. And I'm not going to talk in great depth about any individual case, but later on uh, in my talk, I will talk about a couple of examples of people I've worked with. But it's tough managing all the things you have to do, your ambitions, your needs, your family, your parents' pressures, and the world around you. And that's always, I say, always been the case, not just now in, in, in this century, but in many other centuries, we know that there has always been, diff not a, everybody finds it easy just to get on happily in the world that they're born into. And there have always been ways that society's had to offer people some way of feeling better about themselves and other people when people find things difficult. And I've just listed historically a range of ways in which society has offered <coughs> people who are struggling a bit. And there are many ways of dealing with distress. So if, you're the, the, if you like, so start off as a law, people who behave differently or oddly, we deal with them legally. We put them in a class, maybe that's somebody who's, got, who's behaving badly. We put them in prison or we put them away somewhere. So the law deals with people. And this, to this day, when people start behave, behaving strangely in the street or something happens which is challenging, we may call a police or a lawyer to deal with that. That's one way of dealing with people who are behaving differently. Another way, of course, is medicine, and medicine has always been a place, and nowadays we tend to turn to, if you're unhappy, go and see your GP, and maybe they can find some way of helping you with that. Other ways include religion, and some way that, that if you like, you can go and see your priest, and typically and historically, these three, uh, three methods, the law, medicine, and religion, have been the way that people have dealt with feeling low, feeling dif having difficulties, children behaving who are challenging, behaving in ways which we want to change. Those, if you like, those are the big ways in the past that people have dealt with uh, difficulties. I've also put magic there because, again, another approach is, for example, using astrology or some other sort of technique to deal with people who are behaving strangely or feel bad about themselves. And to this day, you can look up in, in your, your astronomical signs and look up what, what, read the future. People still use that as a way of making themselves feel better when they're not happy. I mentioned politics there again because changing society is another way of trying to change people's emotions and, and, and ability to get on with life. 
If you like, those have been the big ways in which in the past we've dealt with distress. But increasingly, and certainly since the 19th century, people have tried to understand the mind. People have tried to understand what's going on inside our heads. And the science of psychology has developed. And that's the background to clinical psychology. And I will just briefly mention what that is. Uh, any of you, um, psychology is now the most uh, in-demand undergraduate course in the UK to do, your, to do your degree in. And it's the most competitive, one of the most competitive degrees to do. And it's a, psych it's a study of human experience and behaviour. And very quickly, I've run through some of the things that happens within psychology. In order to become a clinical psychologist, you study this first. And the kind of things we'd study is how is it we learn things, how we how memory works, and importantly, how we forget things. That's a very important part of the system. What stress does to us and how we are different from other species. How hormones operate on us and how, for example, drugs and alcohol work on the body and the mind. Why do we sleep? Why don't we sleep? Um, and what it is, how the perceptual system works, how the brain sees, feels, and how emotions work perception, how perception works, how we are, how we recognise people and how we attend to other people or to anything else, and how we make judgments. So the whole way in which the brain works is the subject of psychology. And as a science, it's really quite recent, it's maybe two, 200 years or so, but the most progress has been made within the last 50 years. Other things psychology does is why we have emotions, why we feel, and particularly child development, how children learn, how, to, how, how they learn social behaviour and language and how people attach to one another and how important relationships are. How children separate when they eventually do what that process is and how important it is and what the effects of ageing are, how we get along, how we behave differently socially with other people and how groups differ from one another and why we get on with other and how we get along with authority. Those are just a sample of what you study in psychology. So that as any of you might have done a psychology degree, this will be familiar to you. And this is the equivalent, as in medicine, of studying genetics, physiology, anatomy. So if you want to be a clinical psychologist, you do all this first, so you have a notion of how the human mind works and how people behave. So that's our bread and butter. So that, if you like, is the degree that I originally studied. But I was most interested in what when it all goes wrong, when people are unhappy, and what happens during the periods of life when most of us have some challenges, what can we learn in the same way as when you do anatomy and physiology and genetics, if you're a doctor, if you understand that, well, what is it when it doesn't work? So clinical psychology, which is, I say, my interest, is the application of psychology in clinical settings where people have emotional or psychological difficulties. And these include hospitals, in particular mental health, and, but also child health, and also, and, or clinics, wherever people present with psychological distress. So clinical psychologists work in a variety of different places. My early um, years in, in the 1970s, 80s was working in psychiatric hospitals, but people also work in general hospitals. So it works across the lifespan from infants, so how people may, may have difficulties in early relationship attachments and things like adoption and some of the kind of difficulties that can, children can experience and the relationships between early between parents and, and babies through to the very old and the pulse process of letting go of life at the end of life. Now, we, as clinical psychologists, you work very closely with medicine. And I mentioned the training to become a doctor. One of the things you can do, I mean, I, I, if you know all this, forgive me if I'm telling you stuff you know, but just in case, um, one of the specialties within medicine, when you've done your basic training, you can choose to do is psychiatry. Now, psychiatry is different from clinical psychology in that to be a psychiatrist, which in fact our daughter is, you have to do medicine first. So she's done the whole business of anatomy, physiology and all that stuff, which I didn't do. So she's very familiar with and psychiatrists know about how the body works. And their treatment of mental health problems tends to be oriented towards the physical. So, for example, the treatment psychiatrists tend to give, if you say so, if you're suffering from depression or stress and you go see a psychiatrist, they will tend to, first of all, they'll do a very thorough physical examination and they will may well give you some medical treatments, for example, antidepressants or um, some other sort of physical treatment for your condition. Now, I'm not qualified to do that. I'm not a doctor. I wouldn't do that. But I work very closely with doctors so that we will see people where perhaps medical treatment isn't appropriate or it's not thought to be helpful in this case, where we, we have a close relationship, we cross-refer to one another. 
but we have a different treatment. Our treatment is psychological, not physical, though I'm very aware, of course, we have bodies and therefore hormones and things are important. And, and, and drugs do have an impact. Indeed, there's nothing wrong with, with psychiatric treatments like, like antidepressants. They can be used very much with psychological treatments. So we work together. So particularly psychiatry, and we offer a different perspective. So by and large, the, the model underlying psychiatry, underlying it, is a physical one, which is there's something wrong with your hormone balance or with the endocrines or the, the brain chemicals. So you can fix it with, a med with medication. Whereas we'll understand when people have distress, depression or personality relationship difficulties or children behave challenging ways or families break down, that it isn't an illness that's happened to you, though that's a convenient label. It's not an illness, it's a complex human response to trauma or challenge or difficulties. So what's wrong with you is while we can treat it medically and often those treatments help, interestingly, they do help, the cause may be something else. So by and large, what we do is help people to develop <coughs> solutions to their problems rather than if you come and find a medical way of fixing it. But again, we do work with doctors. And if you do have depression, often the very first useful thing to do is to try antidepressants because we know they're effective. And if they're effective, fine, because you can get back to work, and that's great. But if it doesn't fix it or you don't want to use antidepressants, often a psychological approach is, a, is the next step. To complicate matters, many psychiatrists also use psychological treatments. Uh, so they, they will use the methods that I might use. But I won't be prescribing because that isn't my background. So we do work with them. But our speciality is the psychological, based on all that research, all that knowledge, to do with how people think, how people perceive, how people develop, all that stuff I mentioned earlier, which is our kind of basic stuff. So we work with people to try and develop a solution to the problem and based very much on a collaborative relationship. So patients are referred to clinical psychologists usually because they go to see their GP or somebody suggests they may be, they need a bit of help, perhaps because they, they've got difficulties in the family, the child is repeatedly challenging or difficult or the child is very anxious, or perhaps the adult, you or me, and it's very much like all of us could be in the situation, feel, uh, feel depressed, feel anxious, have difficulties in our relationships, or maybe granny is getting more and more challenging to us, living at home with us. We, we don't quite know how best to help the family to adapt to the fact we've now got granny living with us, and that's difficult. We've also got a teenager who, who, who wants to go out drinking and uh, all sorts of problems. These are human problems, which aren't illnesses. Can we find a way of solving it? And we very much work with people who bring their problems to us and tell us about them in confidence. Because it's confidential and um, and, and collaborative. We, it's, ethics is very important to us, so we have a very strong ethical code. We are regulated by the Health Professions Council, uh, which is like the General Medical Council, and we also have um, a professional organisation, the British Psychological Society, which has codes of ethics that we have to abide by. And these specify very clearly that we're there to help the patient, not ourselves. And that's important because typically what happens is that a patient will come to say, see me, and I should mention I've mostly worked with adults, will come to see me with a, a problem, a difficulty, and will trust me, hopefully, with telling me some very intimate personal things. And my responsibility is to help them the best I can to solve their problems, not, to, if you like, not because I think I've got the answer. Uh, I can't say to them, oh, well, if you voted Labour, your problems would be solved. That wouldn't be my responsibility. Um, I've got to help them work out the solution. And if you like, this little cartoon summarises it. Um, we're encouraging people to become involved in their own rescue. Uh, I don't think that's very ethical there, though that man is busy reading his comic book while the person's drowning. We wouldn't quite do that. But we certainly don't come up with answers for people because there isn't any point in that. Uh, we don't have an answer. We help people to think differently and to help them to see how they've got into the, like into the situation they're in when they're feeling muddled or they're feeling upset. So it's a collab we're our helper, if you like. We work with them to, to, to change the situation. So the kind of people who go and see clinical psychologists, these are typical clients, people with phobias, so fears, which are very common, or anxiety. Um, these are, the, in a way, some of the easiest problems to solve if you've got a fear of of lifts or wasps or spiders or, or cliffs or something, aeroplanes. Those are quite relatively straightforward difficulties and often that's to do with people over long term avoiding discovering those things are actually quite harmless. So that's, that's, a, that's a very common 
difficulty, very common amongst children. People often grow out of them, but again, people can get stuck. People with depression, that's a more complicated problem, and there are lots of reasons why you might experience depression. Life is challenging for you. We can't solve that. Life is difficult. Life is tough, remember I said, but we can maybe help you to understand that ways you've tried to solve your depression are paradoxically not helping you. Um, so things like relationship problems, people who've got, again, stuck in, in things which are difficult, needs another perspective. People with eating disorders, and psychosis. Psychosis if, um, is, uh, if you like, how we tend to use the term now rather than schizophrenia uh, or manic, manic depression. Those are words we tend not to use so much now because we're much more thinking about what's going on in the, in the mind. Psychosis is disordered thinking. We're starting to understand it better now um, uh, based on lots of good, very good psychological research. But very serious mental health problems which are very challenging and very disruptive to people's lives. People who have long-term difficulties in the past used to be hospitalised, but now we have better ways of managing it, together with psychiatrists who have better drugs to help. Also people with physical illnesses like cancer, stroke or spinal injury, if you have a life-threatening illness, it affects the way you think and feel, inevitably. And children with a range of family and individual um, uh, disorders of different types, um, difficulties in relationships, school refusals, fa uh, um, disruptive behaviour in the family, or, or child anxiety, which is very common. And, and people with brain injuries and developmental disorders, all of which have a psychological component. You can't just have, say, diabetes or a stroke or heart disease without it also infecting how you think and feel. So we use a number of models. Some of you have heard of CBT. That's very common now. The cognitive model says the thing that's let's pay attention to when there's a disorder and unhappiness is how you think. So we think we look at how it is your understanding, your perceptions of what's going on. Um, the underlying idea here is that sometimes people can understand something in a particular way which leads them to have particular emotions. And what's difficult is the way they're thinking. When you are depressed, for example, we know when people suffer from depression, they tend to think in more concrete ways. They jump to conclusions. They'll see things in more black and white, which can lead you to make assumptions about the world. Um, and I'll come back to that in a, in, a, in a minute. But that can lead, that can aggravate your low mood. So when we're walking with, working with depression using a cognitive model, we try to help, help, help people to see how their thinking is actually unhelpful to them. Behavioural people, uh, we use treatments, for example, say with children, whereby people, we help people to train how they behave, and again, that leads to different consequences. CBT is a combination of behaviourism and cognitive therapy, which is increasingly popular. A lot of evidence suggests it's very effective. Psychodynamic, this is more Freudian thinking, try to understand relationships, in particular attachments, and difficulties people have in attachments. And what I call systemic, this is trying to understand how the system around you, perhaps at work or in your family, is aggravating your difficulties. So we'll use all these models. The way we work is, is if you like, a, a series of stages. <coughs> First of all, the person is assessed. So a person seeing me, I will ask them about what's happening to their lives, uh, what's happened to them, what, what, what's the history of the problem, what's going on in your life, who is in your family, are you working, what else is happening to you. So we might use questionnaires or just talking to somebody. And we might pay attention to how they are in relationship with us. So are they very challenging or are they very passive? So we'll pay attention to those things, in, if like in the room, in the assessment room. We'll then come up with a formulation, which is a bit like the diagnosis in medicine. And in particular, we're interested in the predisposing factors. What, why, what, why does this person have this problem here. And what, is there something in the background? Perhaps they come from a background where people were anxious in the family. What precipitated it? What happened last week or a month ago that led to it happening now? And what is the presenting problem? What's going on? Why is it staying there? Why is it, perpe why is it perpetuated? Why haven't people, people don't want to be sick or ill or unhappy. Why is it going on? What's, what's going on? Why is it perpetuating? And if you like, what is going on which is protecting them in their lives? Everybody has some good things. So have they got good relationships? Have they got a good job? Have they got something somewhere which is also helping them to manage? So we need to know all of that. We then come up with a formulation, which is, a tri which is like a diagnosis. And I'll show you some formulations in a minute. We then do it in agreement. We'll draw up a, a plan to intervene to change things. For example, if we're using a, a cognitive model, we might say we might set about a series of cognitive experiments, helping them to think differently about whatever the problem is. 
or, or behaviourally, we'll again, we may set up again some little experiments to do with the person. Uh, this, just an example, someone who's frightened of going up and down in lifts, they're frightened that something catastrophic will happen, very scared of going near a lift. You have lift, lot of lifts, you'd have to walk up and down the stairs every day, it'd be a pain. So what we will do is help the person who's very frightened of this. First of all, watch me going up, uh, trusting me, I'll go up and down the lift, they'll watch me doing it, then eventually we'll stand inside the lift without closing the doors and they'll get used to that. Next time we'll go inside, perhaps they'll go up together on one floor, which is very scary, but I'll be with them, helping them to relax, helping them to experience less tension. And then the next time we might get them to go up three floors and finally to go on their own, up and down. So that would be a very simple behavioural treatment. If it's a relationship problem, it's not quite as simple as that, um, as you can imagine, but we would come up with some other ways of, of perhaps suggesting an alternative. We then evaluate, did it work, didn't it work? If it didn't work, go back to square one, try something else. At the same time, we're doing research because we want to make sure we have the right treatments for the future. How we tend to tend work, well, it takes about eight years to train, to see somebody, so as I said, a degree in psychology first, then we don't like to take somebody straight off because they're very young and a little bit ex inexperienced when you're 21. So we often ask them to go and get some work in the workplace, maybe in hospitals or somewhere where they're working with people to make sure that they get a bit more experience. We then do a three-year doctorate, so that's why it's around eight years altogether, uh, which is what my last job is doing that, uh, training people. Our model, is, uh, model underlying is science practitioner. In other words, we are practicing. We're not in labs, but we are using the notion of science because we test something, does it work, doesn't it work? If it doesn't work, we try something else. We're always measuring, has it worked? What's the outcome? So we get people to fill in questionnaires, drive them mad, but we need to do that to make sure we are on the right lines. And we use research-based evidence trials, which indicate what's, what works and what doesn't. A lot of uh, a role for that. We spend a long time reflecting. We need to make sure we're behaving ethically and we're aware of the context of what's, what people want to do in one context with, um, with one ethnic grouping might be different from another one. When in the UK, this is pretty much based in the NHS. We've, our, fund, our training is funded in the NHS. In the rest of the world, it's very different. People very much self-fund their training and work privately. There's a little bit of private work in the UK increasingly, but I've never worked privately myself. I've spent all my life in the NHS or in academia. Um, if you want to see a clinical psychologist, they do advertise. They're increasingly working privately. Um, we normally it's people referred by GP or another medical specialty. So, for example, a renal specialist might say, this person's having difficulties adapting to the need to be on dialysis. Can you help them? Or this person's had a brain injury, let's work with them, with their families, to help them back to normal life. And it's typically based on a series of sessions over several months. So the course of treatment might be six months or whatever, or, or less, depending on what the problem is. So the, I'll come back to the current dates in a minute. I'm just going to show you a formulation. This is a bit tricky, but we often draw diagrams. So I want you to have a look at this person here. The very bottom of this diagram, if you can see this person, and this is a case taken from a, out from a book by Ryle and Kerr. It's, in, it's mentioned in the book. At the very bottom, this person came to see, she's a woman, she came, her name was Beatrice, comes to see the psychiatrist or the psychologist feeling really depressed. She describes herself as being like a frozen chicken in the supermarket. She says she's like wrapped up in cling film as a frozen chicken. That's her self-image of herself. Frozen, no longer in relationships, unable to do anything. Really miserable in her early 30s. That's how she comes along. What do I do? Well, antidepressants might help a bit, but actually there's something else going on. So we try to understand the story. Go right back to the beginning of her story inside the red box. We've, it turns out she has parents who really were quite critical of her. They rejected her and were quite demanding of her. And she felt, in response to her parents, she felt very guilty about it, but she also tried to work really hard. So she's in the red box there. She's striving and needy. Her needs aren't being met by her parents. She's quite independent. She's also quite rebellious at school. So there she's at school as a young girl. She actually gets expelled. So if you look on the side there, rebel gets rejected. Can you see that? She, she gets expelled from school, which just makes her feel worse. So she longs for closeness because she's, a, she's, a, she's a, 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 an attractive young woman, makes a series of relationships. She often has relationships. She fears abandonment. She's in the centre now. She fears abandonment. She avoids getting close to her boyfriends. She feels very lonely. She withdraws from people. Her needs are often unmet. She feels depressed and she feels like a frozen chicken. She doesn't dare reveal herself. So she sometimes on the other side, on the le is it left or right, it's this side here, 
She risks becoming closer to people. She tends to idealise the person she falls in love with. She makes them out to be perfect, has an, a moment of complete being in love, their perfect relationship. She then feels totally... Uh, she, t she, she feels being worthwhile, but she fears being abandoned. She run, runs away again because she can't cope with the idea of being abandoned, and she's back to the frozen chicken. Sometimes, on the other side, she strives very hard to please people. She pretends to be something she isn't. She hates herself. Her needs are unmet. She doesn't reveal herself, and then she feels depressed. So, if you like, this is a joint collaborative formulation we've made of the kind of problems that she has. That's a formulation. Another example of a formulation here, this was a man called Terry who used to drink too much. He had very, again, inside the red box, the red circle, he had very rejecting, abandoning parents who were very contemptuous of him. As a child, he's in a place of B. He's very alone, felt his needs for closeness and wanting was, very, was contemptible. And what we find in life is you, you often tend to reproduce psychologically some of the things your parents did to you in your attachments. So he, to himself, was very rejecting. He uh, was very angry with himself. What he tended to do again, have a, uh, he would, he would, he he was he's, he worked he worked in in industry. What he would find is that one because he was quite contemptuous and angry with people, he'd look around at his peers and he'd often find that other people weren't as good as him. So there was he would say to other people, other people were he's the he's the best. Other people would be better than him, and he would re reject other people. Not surprisingly, when he did that, other people would reject him and he would be then end up being very lonely, and he would, in fact, what he ended up doing was drinking, so he would end up being very depressed. He was down here, he I'm the worst person in the world, and he'd drink. So he'd have a pattern of being contemptuous of others and contemptuous of himself, and he would reduce that, he would reproduce that pattern when we analyse his relationships with others. He would constantly feel he was either the best or the worst. He had one way of thinking about people. He had to be the best of something or the worst of something. He was always winning awards at work, and then he'd win awards, he'd, get, he'd, have a, he'd, he'd boast and other people would then reject him and he'd end, end up drinking. Um, and it was a pattern he went round and round and round and he'd find it very difficult to accept himself as he was. So that's the kind of formulation we might draw up in collaboration with a patient. And then following a, a formulation like that, we would then introduce ways of change. So for example, if you look at this lady here, we then talked about her sense of being rejected by others, why, what, what, what was about her which, was, which wasn't worthy, why she was avoiding closeness, and trying to help her to accept herself more, and gradually, therefore, to stop idealising the men she met, which she would go into a completely over-the-top relationship where she'd want to move in the day she met them, and they would then run away from her, help her to be a little bit more, more careful about the relationships she got into, and gradually develop relationships where she could be with people not as perfect, without them being perfect, but more <coughs> egalitarian relationship. And again, with Terry, to help him to not be so contemptuous of others, because the pattern he got into was always to put other people down, which meant they put him down. So that's what you might do in your, in your, in your, in your treatment. So I'd say the, that's quite a, a, a different approach from giving someone antidepressants, so we might well work with antidepressants, as I say, if somebody is feeling depression. Uh, depression. What the challenges are is how scientific is all of this. You may say, well, what's that got to do with science? We try to be science practitioners. Really, it's based on studies which have used models like this. Do they work? Don't they work? And there's a lot of evidence that CBT is effective, as, as I've mentioned. Uh, and so with, there's a lot of, of, of work done. What are the, what are the, what are the studies? What are we, does this treatment work? Doesn't it work? With which patients does it work? And one of the problems we have in psychiatry and in psychology is that actually humans are terribly varied. Everybody in this room has a different story. Doing psychological research is complicated because you all have different experiences, whereas probably most of your kidneys or livers work kind of the same, one would imagine, um, but your histories, your psychology is going to be so different. And we've tended to give one treatment to everybody. And in what the research demands is that we have more and more nuanced treatments for different people. You wouldn't want the same treatment as the person next to you because your life story is different. And that's why often we don't get it right because it's very difficult to get it right. Um, laws and medicine, if you like, I like to say that they're difficult subjects are probably simpler because people are not so different. I mean, there are many ways in which you can be physically ill and break the law and, do, uh, and, and have legal complications. But if you like, the numbers of ways in which people relate to each other is so infinitely complicated, it's difficult. And we do our best to be scientific, but we don't always get it right. 
Uh, therefore, we do spend a lot of time thinking about it, and sometimes we get o over-reflective and we spend our time thinking, and maybe that's not always helpful. There are not so many of us, because it's very expensive to train somebody to, 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 to become a clinical psychologist, several hundreds of thousands. And so the, you know, like the NHS can't afford that many, and we tend to be, you know, with relatively few of us. So I, I don't know how many of you ever, actually just out of interest, how many of you have heard of clinical psychologists as a profession? Ah, you've heard of us, great. But, I, I, but, but, but probably not many, how many of you actually know a clinical psychologist personally? About four or five of you, okay. And that's, that's great that you do. Um, there are not many, there are many, many more psychiatrists. Psychiatrists are much more numerous than us. And of course, many, 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 many more doctors um, there are many no, more, most mental health care, certainly in the UK, is provided through the NHS, it's provided by nurses and doctors, we're very small in number, and so how can we have, these models are very interesting, um, but it's hard to, to actually see somebody, the chances of seeing a, a clinical psychologist are really quite small because there are so few of us. Um, and one of the other things is, is that we know very well that that the things that often precipitate the background to mental health problems in particular are things like poverty and, um, and, 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 and exclusion. So we know that mental health problems are much more dominant within groups that have poor resources. Um, and if you like, if you want to improve the mental health of the nation as a whole, you might want to pay more attention to things like education, and, and, and employment, unemployment and so on, uh, and inequalities. Um, and we are, looking, we are looking at the individual victims, if you like. We get the people who have been damaged by some of those things. Um, and maybe a better thing would be to change society as a whole, because those are the things that lead to some of the mental health problems that there are. Um, we're, we're fixing the individuals. I, I appreciate you have to do both, but often there's a tension between should we treat the people, or should we try and change the system, which leads to people having these problems? We could talk more about that. And so, and one of the other things is, could we make, you know, you make much more better use of individual and information technology. The treatments, particularly the CBT treatments that, that um, are, are increasingly used, they are open to being used with technology. For example, some of the individual treatments, rather than coming to see me to do a, a, a desensitization, which is a treatment for your fear of lifts or something, could you do that online? And there are treatments which can be provided online. I had a go at this myself, actually, a few years ago, because um, there's a very good program for people who have sleep problems called um, Sleepio, thank you, called Sleepio, which is an, a CBT online treatment. Um, it's in fact set up by a colleague of mine from Glasgow University, now in Oxford. I don't have a major sleep problem, but I thought, well, I quite fancy, you know, sleeping a bit better. So I did this sleep program, um, which m meant I had to go every week, I had to go online and about an hour and answer questions and do things differently. And it was very well designed. And actually, I have to say, it really did work. It increased my ability to sleep well through the night. And it was very nice. The only try was I, I kind of slipped back into my bad habits after a while, which is reading in the middle of the night and <laughs> things and, and, and stuff and staying in bed late, which you shouldn't do if you've got sleep problems. But um, you know, we should use information technology better to try and, and spread, if you like, psychological treatments to more people. And there are ways of doing that. Um, it's very much what, what I think the next generation is going to include. Um, so I think you know, that, that's, that's the next. And I'm interesting, here I'm at Google thinking with you, thinking about what can we do to spread good mental health practice. We know that depression is a major cause of, of dysfunction in, in the world out there. Most of us in our lifetime will have either ourselves or one of our friends and family will have some mental health problem and it will cause distress to families and we can treat it medically although not everybody responds to medication and in many ways having what we know is that psychological treatment and medical treatment together is one of the best but it's hugely time consuming and it's demanding and it's expensive. So is there some way in which we could deliver better treatment better? One of the things that makes it difficult is that one of the things we know is important in making the psychological treatment work is the relationship that you develop with the person you're helping. So that's very important that we have a close relationship. How can you reproduce a relationship with a computer? Because we know that that bond, the person who goes up and down the lift with me, the reason she's prepared to do it is we spent several hours beforehand where I've listened to her, I've given her my attention, she trusts me, she knows that I respect her, 
I'm not belittling her, and I'm therefore, so she trusts me in order to try doing it. How could you do that, if you like, on a computer? So that's one of our challenges, how to deliver more widely the mental health treatments that we have to people. I think I've probably talked enough. I was asked to talk about 30 minutes I've done. So I'm be more than happy to take the conversation further in any direction that people would be interested. Somebody at the back and somebody at front. Is an educational psychologist the same as a clinical psychologist? Th thank you for asking me, and I perhaps should have clarified. When you've done your first degree, as I mentioned with all that, those subjects, you either you can just, that's a degree, it could have been history or physics or something, you go and work for Google or something, don't use your psychology again. Or you can become an applied psychologist, and there are about seven branches of psychology which are applied. One is clinical, that was the bit I wanted to do. One is, uh, you mentioned educational, there are things like occupational, which is helping design workplaces and things. Um, educational is particularly working with children in schools, how children learn, and uh, looking in particular at family difficulties. So that if you're interested in in how to be affect how dyslexia and how children behave in schools, that's an area to go into. Whereas what I trained, where I trained was a lot, was in the NHS, in clinical settings, hospital settings. Um, educational psychologists, so, so I uh, often do teaching first, so they're very familiar with the uh, educational system before they start working with teachers about how to work. As I, worked in I worked in the NHS as a, an assistant occupational therapist for a bit. So I got used to, if you like, how the hospitals work, how the doctors, how the teams work. So you, you know the workplace. Educational psychologists will use many of the same models like CBT. So the, the, our theories are the same. It's the workplace that is different. But thanks for that question. And there's um, I wanted to ask about widespread uh, models, I guess, and my widespread processes. Because, of course, depression and anxiety, they come from things such as maybe, or they stem from skills like resilience and things like that. Do you know if they're doing such, you know, a, a resilience course at schools nowadays? That's interesting, yes. Because uh, indeed, w w I think it's very important context. Although, when you experience depression or anxiety, you, th you, know, you think it's you because you, you know, obviously that's how you experience it. It is indeed your, your life which is, you know, which is in disorder or, or discomfort. But you're not alone, and many other people have the same issues. And things like stress and the demands of commuting and the demands of managing workplace and the family and all that stuff, as all this adds. And you're, yes, so the context is important. So could we do something about that context to reduce some of that stuff? And of course, the, the real world in which we are all competing and there is demands is difficult to change all of that unless we all go and give up and live in the countryside. But assuming we don't do that, can the workplace do something? Can schools do something? One of the, one of the, the kind of fashionable um, ideas is mindfulness. What mindfulness is a way, people have heard of that, is a way of trying to help you to get away from particular critical thoughts. And the, the underlying model of why mindfulness works, and they are teaching this in schools now, and maybe in workplaces. It's like relaxation. It's helping you to get off the, tra the treadmill. So if you look at the, um, if you like, uh, this, this poor person here, she's in a treadmill. Because people don't want to be unhappy. We sometimes say, oh, she, she's her own worst enemy. She makes it, she wants to, she doesn't want to get better. It's not that you don't want to get better. You don't know how to change. So it's, n and change is very scary. Because if you always do, if you always walk in the same way, someone asks you to walk differently, how do you do that? It's really hard, and we shouldn't us underestimate that. So what, what mindfulness and these trainings try to do is to help you to get off the treadmill that you're on and think, or think about it differently. So yes, there is an attempt to do that, and then that is going to be a better way of solving problems. But it's such a huge thing, and it's, what we know is that mindfulness does work to a degree, but then again, it's not good enough yet. We still don't have a panacea. Again, the evidence, the evidence shows that, that it has a, some small effect. I can't, the, the evidence on teaching mindfulness in schools is for some children it is helpful, but not for all of them. Partly it's just difficult to engage all the kids in it. Um, so yes, the evidence is that it, and again, using, trying to be scientists about it, it works for some people some of the time. And we're, we're on the case, but it's, there isn't a solution to everything yet because it's, it's complex. So I know that's, that's not a good story to tell. I'd love to say yes. But it's not, we don't know yet. Somebody here had something. Okay. 
Thank you. I, I was wondering how do clinical psychology practitioners deal with all the kind of the heavy information and all the kind of difficult stories after work, hmm. how they decompress? Yeah. How do you deal with it? I think it's very interesting and increasingly we're, we're getting a bit better at that than we were. Um, I, t I mentioned one of our skills was being reflective, how reflective should we be? Everybody um, in, in practice is supposed to have a supervisor, which doesn't mean someone to tell you what to do, it's somebody you can go and talk to about things. Um, and I, I, it is, in, in a sense, it's like, like being a doctor, you, you kind of get used to it. I mean, I, I, I have to say that, that uh, over my life, I think I've become a bit inured to stories that people tell me, and sometimes I think I'm getting hard-hearted, because there isn't too much horrible stuff that I've not heard. Um, you do get used to it. The thing that, that I found quite difficult is I, when I was first working, um, one of the big issues, I talked about trauma. Um, one of the things that we know, for example, is that childhood abuse and ne neglect and abandonment as a child is, is bad for you. We know that having an unhappy childhood is not good for you. That's a, a, a one statement I can make. Um, it, and when you hear stories about how children have been harmed by society or by families, that's very difficult. I used to find that really hard to hear that. And I, particularly when I had my own children, I was hearing stories about children being abused. That was difficult. We do, we do have the idea is you have somebody who's been through it before. And I think you, you kind of, you, you focus on what to do about it rather than going on about it. Again, we tend not to talk too much about the past. We're talking about how things are, how things are playing out now because you can't change the past. What is happening now today in your relationships which maybe we could change? For example, one of the things we find about people who've, who've been abused to children is not that they abuse others, because they often, they don't. There's a myth sometimes that they do. What they do is they abuse themselves. They often, they attack themselves rather than attack anybody else. So that's what you want to work with, is people self-harming and self, it's like psychological harming rather than going to the past. So I think you hear it, but then you say, what do we do about it now? So you kind of have a hopeful way out of it. Various hands. So um, what do you think uh, the biggest differences between approaches to clinical psychology um, in the U.S. and the U.K. are? That's interesting because uh, my colleagues, uh, you know, who work in the U.K., and I did spend um, a couple of months in, 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 the, in University of Florida and looking at the, <coughs> the, system, uh, the health system there. I'm not that experienced, but, you know, but what I understand. One of the big differences is because we're NHS-based, clinical psychology by and large, we, we tend to have shorter treatments because of the cost of treatment. And we, so we, we're very much evidence-based, what is it that works in the shortest time. So there's more pressure to do things more quickly. It tends to be, therefore, CBT is the model of choice, whereas in the US there's more psychodynamic therapies, which is more Freudian-based or relationship-based, which take a bit longer. The evidence is they're equally helpful, but they take longer. So that's a difference we notice. That's the most obvious difference. There's somebody, lots of hands. <laughs> Good, I like this. Um, would you expect in years to come that there will be lots of things in your red box associated with social media and social media pressures, particularly on adolescents? Yeah, that's very interesting because I think uh, what, what, what you are, one is humans are enormously influenced by people around them and, and the, your close relationships, your parents, your friends are very important to you. Especially for adolescents, they, there's a huge, you, when you're, the process of separation from parents, we are, as humans, we need attachments to others. Separation process from your parents means you start to attach, particularly in the teen years, to your peer group. And if your peer group is a perfect peer group, on social media who all look fantastic and go to parties all the time and have a great time, but you're not. That teaches you you're not a very worthwhile person. So I think, yes, I do see that's a problem. And particularly for adolescents, we know that mental health of young people today is getting worse. And, and I suspect, but I don't know well enough what the evidence is. I have a social psychologist who come, we, what, do you know what the evidence is on social media? Sorry. Um, by and large, um, well, it's, uh, it's, it's your, uh, for some people, for some people, social media is clearly bad, um, and it's a, a mixture of two things. One is we always make social comparisons, but normally, if you like, that's within a group of 25, 30 people. Uh, suddenly, you've got 700,000 
to make your comparisons with, and guess what, you come out badly. Um, and the other thing is that people behave worse to each other when they're not face to face. It's anonymity. Um, uh, people do much nastier things to mm -hmm. each other over social media than they would face to face. So those two factors make it a very dangerous place to be, even though it's got lots of positives. Mm -hmm. um, but so I think going back to the programme, so it's teaching people how to use social media. Because I'm mean, certainly when I, I'm, I, I don't use Facebook, whenever I see anything, I think, oh God, these people are all having much more fun than I'm having. But of course, it's all myth and story. I know that. But it's hard when you're when you're young. How do you know that for sure? So yes, I think that's one of the boxes you would put in there, which is that the world around you is much more likely to be uh, a, a, a less comfortable place to be when you're just a little you with all your little problems. So I think that's that's certainly true. And I think that 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 helping people to ways of dealing with that and understanding that of course you put you spend hours making the perfect selfie. Most of us don't look like that most of the time. So yes, I'm sure that's true. Uh, you've mentioned uh, the relationship between the therapist and therapy. Uh, how do you deal with uh, people that kind of get addicted to your to the relationship, mm. relying more on their therapy than solving their problems on their own? Yes, it's a very interesting issue because one of the things you're doing when you a patient comes <coughs> and tells that client, whichever word you're <coughs> using, we, we use both, comes to see you and tells you, your, you they feel like their difficulties. Um, prof my professional job is to listen to the person, give them my full attention and understand them. So I'm giving them a lot of sort of cues that I'm there for them. We have to be very careful that's not misunderstood in the relationship because normally when you sit on your own with somebody in a room and they're paying you really good attention for an hour or something, um, that, that, uh, that's a very nice experience to be listened to, being valued, especially if the person has very few other places where they are experienced as valued which is why it's very important that we have a lot of signals and signs around, which is this is, a, this is a professional relationship. This is not a personal relationship. And there's always that difficulty at some point where the person may start to, to wish they had a personal relationship with you. I've certainly had people want to ask me out to dinner and people have got, you know, t t wanted a per more personal relationship. And that's understandable because you're being terribly nice to them <laughs> and you're listening to them and being there for them. But again, it's very important that you are very also very clear. It's why we often use our professional titles and we only see people in consulting rooms. This is not a social space. This is a workspace. And all the time you're helping them to understand that this is a, this is a, a way of talking about your problems. This isn't solving your problems. The pro problems are out there and we're going to help you get back out there again. This is limited. And we also often talk about time limits. So we'll say, I'm going to see you for six sessions. And we may, in some models, we actually say, well, you know, we count down the sessions. So they know it's going to come to an end. But it's a very good, and going back to, the, to the, the question about the USA, where you work in a more psychodynamic model, a Freudian model, that model, where you have a longer term relationship, that can be more problematic. And it's part of our training to, ha to handle that. And it's understandable why people can get dependent because, you know, that happens. And the other thing is some, some, of, some many training also require you to have experience of therapy. So you as a therapist can go and part of your training is to be a patient. And you then discover how easy it is to idealise the person or to start rehearsing what you tell them and tell them a partly true story and not a whole true story because you're worried about that. You know. So it's that, that's a good way of handling it. Um, the clinical body nice have to make really difficult decisions mm. about mm. Mm. how they allocate resources. Uh, you know, we can't afford this particular medicine for this group of people. Given there are so few of you, I was just interested to know how, how is it triaged in terms of who's, yeah. who's going to get treatment? Yes, this is National Body of Cl uh, Standard for Clinical Excellence, National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Um, which will provide, a, is that the right acronym, isn't it? No, I see. Yeah. And they, they, they provide a guidance on what treatments. They do recommend psychological treatments um, for a number of different uh, uh, co uh, conditions um, based on evidence, and again, quite rightly based on evidence. If I have treatment, I want to know that it's, it is the right treatment for my particular condition. They, they do recommend it, and for example, one of the things we know in psychosis, I mentioned psychosis, when people have major mental health problems, hallucinations and delusions, that the evidence shows that if you provide treatment 
um, for the individual as early as possible the first episode of psychosis, which normally happens uh, in, the, in the late teens, early 20s, slightly different from men and women, it's a devastate, can be a devastating life course if, you, if it fully develops. If you can get it really early and get early treatment in, you can prevent the condition from developing. You can help a person psychologically and medically if a team gets in there early. So if, if that's a really good news story, is that we don't have long-term patients. If you can get them quick, you can divert the psychosis, you can prevent it. Um, and it's, it's really late, late teens-ish, often connected with, well, sometimes connected with cannabis use, not always. And there are now sources of ev um, evidence that, that show, uh, clear, clear evidence that one of the components is family treatment, where you work with the family to understand how to deal with the young person, because they're often still living at home. Uh, that, and that is what the nice, what the evidence shows we should do, but there aren't enough people. So a lot of people don't get the right treatment. So sadly, there are people out there not getting what we're not nice as they should get because there just aren't enough people. But is it self-defeating in the sense that if they invested up front, you wouldn't have the cost associated yeah, with sure. that family breakdown relationship? Yes, breakdown absolutely. Crime, the drugs, the alcohol, absolutely, absolutely. All those things are true. But it's expensive, and it's a question of how we want to spend our money. I mean, one of the problems, in, I mean, I have to say that it's the last few successive governments have tried, and you'll hear on the news saying that the, this notion of the concept is called parity of esteem, that we esteem our mental health as much as our physical health. But it is not the case. If you have, if you, if you sadly diagnose with some kidney disease or cancer or something, um, you will get seen pretty quickly and be seen by the best experts in your area, hopefully. If you have a mental health problem like psychosis, you don't know whether you're going to get treatment because we don't invest as much in mental as physical health. Um, that's always been the way because we stigmatise mental health. We think there's something wrong with you. You're to blame. Somehow you brought it on yourself if you have a mental health problem. And it's, it goes quite deep-rooted that we use the word, I use it in casual speech. Oh, it's psychological, I'll say. If I've got a stomachache, oh, it's psychological. In other words, it's not real. Because it doesn't mean that at all. Because what is psychological is absolutely real. And we are, we are, we are physical and mental beings. We're all together. We all, you, know, you can't have a mental health problem without a physical health problem and vice versa. But over history, we've tended to put one in box and one in the other, and one's good and one's bad. So mental health hasn't had the investments and the serious treatments. I think that's changing. I'd say that is changing. There is more importance now placed on that. And certainly going back to the question about the UK, US, I don't know if you still hear the gentleman asked. Oh, yes, sir. Is that we've been much more um, nervous to talk about mental health in the UK um, I think it's changing now, p especially with, with CBT coming more, having people more access to it. To say you're having therapy is now reasonable and people will talk about that. It used to be anathema. For example, in our training, when we train people, I remember my, my father saying to me when I was thinking about training, oh, oh that's very interesting, but um, you know, it's, it's not, not uh, if you want to go into this, not working with very nice people and you'll be it's very important that you yourself don't have any mental health problems. Now we see it very differently from that. We see we as trainers and as students and as practitioners may well have mental health problems ourselves. Everybody has mental health problems. We're not different. We're trying to, in the same way as I might break my leg or have diabetes, doesn't make me a bad doctor. Likewise, I might be suffering from mental health problems as well. It's okay to do that. It's not I'm a bad person. So we're trying very much to change the attitudes, which are difficult. So you're absolutely right about that. We should spend more, but that's a political discussion which we can have elsewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you mentioned that CBT and online therapy is quite new. Um, is there any evidence at the moment whether it's more effective than that face-to-face -face therapy? Well, what's interesting, it, is, it seems to be, with, cer with certain groups, it's as effective, which is quite challenging to all of us who've been doing it for years. Um, but what was interesting is, uh, um, yes, it, so it is as effective, and that's a good thing to do, but it has to be set out right, and you have to get the relationship factors in there right. I mentioned I did the Sleepio programme, which, which was interesting to do, but what I found myself doing was I would... I assumed that I was talking to this guy. You know, I would, I would think, well, what's he, what's he thinking about me now? Of course it wasn't he wasn't thinking. It's a programme. But what people do is they like there to be a person there. So I think when we design these things well, they can be helpful. One of the, one of the, one of the very, very important things to do is change how people think about it. And one of the good things about rolling out programmes 
is it helps people to think, to normalise it more. Just quickly, one point I should make about the cognitive model I talked about, where you, you can think. One of, the, one of the most damaging things people can think about is how abnormal their thinking is. And if you can normalise it, it help people to know. What, what, when one of the things we, we know about post-traumatic stress disorder, um, when you've had a, a traumatic e episode, when something happens, if a bomb drops on us, and we, we, it's ghastly and traumatic, we will all have, but assume when we hopefully we survive it, we will have flashbacks, we will have bad experiences. If you can understand that that's normal, that normal people always have bad experiences after a trauma, and gradually they fade over the days, the months, your traumatic experiences will fade, then you will get be better. If you think you are odd and unusual, and this is what evidence shows, that you are uniquely weak and mentally ill because you've had this trauma, this traumatic reaction, then you won't get better so quickly. One of the great things about rolling out large scale is perhaps people will understand that their reactions are actually normal. It's okay to feel trauma, it's okay to feel bad. And that's what rolling out larger scale programs will help people to see their mental health problems are not unique. You're not the only one to feel depressed, sad, angry, have relationship problems. It's normal, it's human. And that's, I think, what large scale programs, which hopefully organisations such as yourselves will be helpful to us in developing. Thank you very much. Thank you.